If you're a post-heart transplant recipient survivor, I've got great news for you, and that is the hard part, for the most part, is over. <laughs> Whether it be in the back seat or maybe even in the rearview mirror, the hardest part of your life, those days are in the past, and now what you have to look forward to is basically a life in which you do the best that you can to take the best care of yourself, and that oftentimes includes a ton of follow-up appointments. Those appointments may include things like blood work, x-rays, EKGs, and even heart casts, which we're talking about today, slash angiograms and biopsies. They're just going to be a part of your life, and that's for good reason. They're really trying to manage, trying to make sure that everything is on the up and up and that you are able to live to your highest potential and that things stay healthy and strong and you just keep on going. That's at least the goal of them and I'm certainly it's the goal of you and of myself towards you. However, in detailing what that heart cath angiogram biopsy procedure looks like, let's just talk for a few moments about that. Of course, the heart cath, all these procedures kind of one and the same to a point and it basically involves them going either in your neck or in your groin, or even radially, that's down through your wrist. They're going in, they're going to place a sheath and then run a catheter through that, which on which they can put many different devices, they can place stents. But generally speaking, what they're mainly doing, they're checking heart pressures as well as kind of taking pictures, just seeing what things look like, making things, making sure that things are doing great. In addition to that, if you're a post-heart transplant recipient, at least for a period, they're more than likely going to do a biopsy. That's just where they go into your heart through that procedure typically most of those are done through the neck if you will but they're going to go in through that procedure and take little small pieces from the inside lining of your heart pull those out and that's going to give them a great idea about whether or not you may or may not be in rejection now rejections can go from anything from an r0 which is basically there is no rejection nothing to worry about to an r1 which means your heart is almost kind of your body is almost kind of reacting normally to your heart there's a slight bit of rejection there but nothing to worry about either most likely you don't even change your medication then but then there's the r2 and r3 which are more severe and they have to be treated and dealt with in the quickest way that they possibly can. Most of that comes down to some medication changes and maybe even the medications you already take. Some of that can include going in and taking plasmopheresis and, and other different IV drips and stuff. I've got other videos on that, by the way, but that are going to pull your body from the rejection and kind of get that immune system calmed down again. But the best way to discover that is through doing that heart cath angiogram slash biopsy procedure. And even though there are other ways to do that now, things like Alamap, Alasure, I've had videos on that as well I'll put up here. But basically speaking, this is the best as far as anything goes to really detecting that. Now, the further you get out, the less and less these are, the farther spaced out they are up until a point. I'm 10 years out right now, and my team doesn't even do biopsies anymore. They still do angiograms and different things just to check those pressures. But as far as looking for rejection, although it could happen, they're more standing back doing that more symptomatically than anything and not actually doing those biopsies but as far as the biopsy itself basically you can consider two to three days being involved in this regularly one day being kind of pre-biopsy pre-angiogram and that really just comes down to you being mpo no food or water by mouth for a certain period of time i think that generally is about six to eight hours prior to the procedure but in a nutshell most teams just say i just Stop eating and drinking after midnight. We'll see you sometime tomorrow. And they probably bring you in early, but even if they don't get around to you, don't get excited. You're still not going to be able to eat, but you are going to be placed on an MPO type of diet prior to the procedure. And that's for your own well-being, particularly uh, relates to your breathing and possible anesthesia such as that. They just trying to be cautious in that now as far as on the day of the procedure you're probably going to arrive early once you get there there'll be some registration more than likely there'll be a couple different things that are involved in your care on that same day the main which would be doing some very thorough blood work just to check several levels particularly your i and r that's really the thinness or thickness of your blood they kind of need to know that before they do any type of procedure where the veins or in this case arteries are going to be disturbed they just kind of have to know a little bit about that so they'll do that blood work that'll probably delay things for a little while depending on your center and my center because everything is done in-house lab wise generally speaking within 20 30 minutes they have those numbers back and they go and proceed with the procedure 
as they choose. Now, once they do that, they're probably going to come in your room and start doing some prep. That may involve, you know, a shaving of the skin of the area, clearing away a beard like this, or, you know, in the groin, whatever. They're going to kind of clean things up, get things prepped. They're going to go over the procedure and probably start an IV drip, mainly just at that point of some basic fluids. More than likely, there won't be anything else involved in that because most of these procedures, particularly when they go into the neck, they're going to do those on a completely local anesthetic situation. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but you're not really being sedated so much as just giving you that local anesthesia just to keep you from having any pain or discomfort during the procedure. However, they will go ahead and start those drips kind of as a just in case so they can get those things administered easily and quickly. And then if they need to do anything extra, they'll already have that line placed as well. But more than likely, they're going to place that line a little bit earlier. They're going to come in and talk to you about the procedure. You're most likely going to talk to the nurses, obviously, that are involved in that part of the care. The doctor's going to come in and speak with you for a bit. And maybe even a real anesthesiologist will come in as a kind of a just in case basis and talk to you about pain management and the things that they're going to be doing during and after the procedure, that sort of thing. But once that is done, they're basically going to set you there to wait. You're going to be waiting like I am, pretty much starving and smelling food at every every round of the corner in, those, uh, in that unit at least. But you'll get through that, and eventually they'll roll you back into the cath lab. Upon doing that, whether or not they walk you back, roll you back, for me, they carry me back on a, on a gurney that I'm already on, a bed that I'm already laying in. They'll move you over to the cath procedure table. Now, that t- table... Be warned, sometimes that thing can be very, very cold. They keep these catalyzed very cold in the beginning, just kind of keep down germs and different bacteria and such that could be swimming around. It's not a completely sterile environment, but they treat it such as that. But oftentimes when you move from that gurney, which you've been there cuddled up in a blanket for a while, over into that cold table... It can be a shocker, especially on the butt talks, as uh, Forrest Gump would say it. But it can be a shocker. Be ready for that. I would advise you at that point, if they offer you an extra, quote, warm blanket, take it, take it, take it. Because even though you might not necessarily need it then, once this procedure goes on for 30, 45 minutes, an hour or two, you're gonna, probably going to wish you had that. But go ahead and take advantage of that and always take it off, you know, or put it back on if you need to during the procedure. But... They're going to put you over on the table. Again, they're going to basically offer you several different levels, potential levels of anesthesia. The main one being just that local anesthesia. Going to go in just little shots around the area. You'll feel those first few pricks. They're going to make out like they're no big deal. And they're kind of a big deal. I don't know if it's because the pain level is really there or if it's just the idea that uh, in my, at least my peripheral vision, I can see the needles coming at me. So a little bit uncomfortable in that. If they're doing the groin, they've got more of a shield up. You don't see as much. Or even radially, your arms out to the side, you don't see as much. But for the neck, it can be a little bit, you know, a little bit of nervous energy that comes in there when you see that. But they're going to put several different uh, shots in there or injections in there to try to numb that skin, numb that area. Once that is done, they'll probably leave you for just a moment, maybe not leave the room, but they'll back up for just a moment, give those things time to kind of get ready. And then my doctor, what he does basically is he takes the needle and just does a little prick and just asks me, is that comfortable? Do I feel that? I usually don't. It usually works very well. Now, that may be all that they do. And for the majority of us, that is pretty much all that they do unless you have a request. And I would encourage you to make this request as often as you can. But you can also request, since the IVs already been placed anyway, I would request they give me just a little bit of sedation. Now, that's not necessarily sedation to put you to sleep. It basically consists of some onboard pain medications as well as some Ativan or some other type of Zoloft. I don't know what all is involved, but kind of fast acting, I guess, will be Ativan. But something to just kind of chill you out and calm your nerves. Because even though I've been through this procedure probably in my past altogether 40, 50, 60 times in my life, it can still be a little bit nerve wracking. And I think mainly the reason I mentioned earlier that we get cold on the table is when you get in that flight or fight mode, sometimes you sweat. Sometimes all the blood leaves your extremities, you know, to come into that rescue mode, flight or fight, and you get cold. And so I like to have that blanket over me nonetheless. But again, prepared to have them pull that off as well because it may change 
just like that. But they're going to go ahead, make sure that you're numb. If you ask for or they're allowing you to have any kind of little mild sedative there, be sure to ask for that. They won't always give it unless you ask. But once they do that, it's going to help things a lot. You'll be able to relax. You'll be able to be still. If you're like I am, when I get nervous, I talk. And they definitely don't want you talking during the procedure, being that they're trying to work right here. And so I think sometimes they give me mine just to kind of shut me up. But I take it. Hey, it helps out just a little bit. Going to go through the procedure. First thing they'll do is make a very small incision. I'm describing this one mostly, but it applies to the groins as well. They'll make a very small incision here i know some people believe they just kind of make a prick or a, a hard stick with a larger needle not really they're using a scalpel they'll make a very very tiny incision just to break that skin and then generally speaking they'll go ahead and push that sheath they call it that's just the liner through which the catheters will pass they'll put that sheath in they'll place that depending on your anatomy those sheaths can be of different lengths okay and uh, depending on the length you can probably have a little bit more easier or lesser success in that i know in my past i've learned that a number four sheath that's just an example works well for me a number three is a little bit short and they can't quite get in there the way they need to a number five i guess is the next one up in between that before i guess being in the middle but like a number five may be a little bit too long and so they can't make the bends that they need to but they'll get used to that the doctors are very highly skilled at that but they'll place a sheath that sheath just basically protects not only your skin but more importantly the artery the vein whatever they're going into and then they'll begin to run the catheters in now the strange thing is is even though you may not feel anything except for kind of some pressure at this point you will feel pressure uh, typically speaking you may not have any real discomfort but you will hear a very familiar sound at least i learned to hear it where they're running in and out the catheters and such it kind of makes a zipping noise it comes in and out of the sheath i've learned to deal with it but you can just tell it and i can again see out of peripheral vision my peripheral vision i can kind of see that thing coming out and so if that whole catheter maybe is like 10 12 15, 18 inches long, you'll see that pulling in and out. But they'll replace that several times, depending on what type of devices they're putting on the end of the catheter, whether it be kind of more of a, a camera or just a probe, if you will. They're going to do different things. They need to do any kind of widening. They won't always stent first, but sometimes they'll stick a little part of that end that will kind of open up, kind of open up and can open up narrow areas and help them work through different things. And they can even stent through this same procedure without any real difficulty but they can take care of business in there. And again, while they're there, they're going to be not only monitoring the pressures of your heart, looking and, and delving in to see if you have any blockages, but they will then take those small biopsy pieces and they'll pull those and, of course, send them off to a lab. And that will help to determine if you're in any form of rejection. Again, it can be R0 up into R3, uh, lesser, the smaller number being lesser and the larger being worser, as I like to say. But they're going to pull those biopsies. Now, as far as the biopsies themselves, they're pretty much painless i have for whatever reason kind of learned to feel i don't know if that's normal uh, comment below if you've endured this if you can kind of feel the biopsy but i've gotten kind of a running joke going back with my doctor doctor to lodge when he does those based on what i feel when he makes that little pull i can tell him before he even gets uh, the catheter back out with that piece of heart on it i can say oh that was a good one or nope that wasn't good enough and he has agreed with me he'll get those things out on the table and he'll look at it you know through his little uh i don't know what you call them they're they're the almost like having a um microscopes on your eyes or something but he'll look at it and say oh, you're right you know i didn't get enough then or whatever but uh you, you'll go through that at least and they'll usually pull three four pieces depending on what they see out of that again typically painless i don't know why i can quote feel it maybe it's just the sensation of it or whatever but painless and that'll pretty much be it they will have already most likely already done all the other parts of that the other measurements and most likely that'll be it now once that is done they're going to first pull obviously all the catheters back out and then they're going to get ready to remove that sheath and typically speaking when they remove the sheath for the most part it's just a kind of a packing that they do they just kind of put uh, uh, cotton balls and different things you know over that they're going to pack it they're going to hold pressure on it for a while again this applies as 
as well to the neck or the groin or radially, they're going to apply an amount of pressure for some time. And typically the doctors step back and let other technicians take care of that. But they're going to apply pressure to that for just a while. Typically for me, depending on who you are, that doesn't last but a few minutes, you know, maybe five, ten minutes max. And then they'll kind of check that and make sure there's no external bleeding at that point. If there's not, then they're moving you back over to the gurney and sending you out is the way that it works for me. Now, once the procedure is completely over, depending on the sedation that you've had, if it's just been a very local anesthetic and it's been in your neck, you're pretty much good to go. They're going to ask you more than likely to sit inside of the lab there for a period of time. They're going to caution you not to lean over, not to bend, not to move, not to lift anything, which I don't know why I'd be lifting there other than the crackers and a bottle of water. Uh, by the way, those no cat. I don't know what they are. I'll put a picture of them up here on the screen. Those things are great. If your transplant center has those, kind of a peanut butter cookie, I'm a fan. But you can ask for those. That's a side note, kind of a power tip. But uh, they are going to have you sitting there probably for about an hour, 30 minutes to an hour. And then at that point, you're released to go on home. If you have it done in your groin, that's going to be a lot more delayed. That's going to be where you lay on your back, depending on whether or not they place the plug in that or whatever. You're most likely going to have a pressure dressing. They used to do kind of the weighted system the i call them sandbag system i don't know that as many do that anymore they use the plug and they do kind of a pressure elastic type of dressing with a packing on top but you're going to lay there after that procedure for anywhere from one to four i've been there as long as five hours and that's not very comfortable they'll start you out completely flat in the beginning and eventually let you raise your bed a little bit up into the point where if you're about ready to go home they're going to ask you if you can to stand up, they're going to assist you with that. But the procedure's over, and you're going to be good to go. Now, once you get home, you need to be very cautious for a while. No matter where this was done, radially, neck, whatever, uh, you need to be cautious for a while. Pay really close attention to the discharge papers. They're going to limit you on your driving, so you've always pretty much going to have to have a driver to go and have this procedure done. They're going to limit certain activities for the next few days. They're going to limit lifting a certain amount of weight. I don't remember if that's you know, five, 10 pounds. For me, uh, not that I felt terrible, but I always took advantage of this and just kind of laid on the couch and relaxed. My wife took care of things. The kids were a big help. But, you know, take it easy for a few days. Just don't strain yourself for whatever reason, even though I'm not really in a lot of pain and there's not a lot of difficulty or bleeding after this. It could be at times, but I'm usually a champ on this, but still I'm kind of wiped. For a day or two, I'm just pretty much wiped. So you don't have to ask me not to do much because I may not do very much. Now, as far as the risk for this procedure, they're obvious. They're going in. They're breaking the skin. There's a potential for infection right there. They're breaking into that artery, the vein, you know, what have you. And so there's going to be some risk right there, risk of bleeding and other things. So you just got to be cautious about that. The doctors know what to do if anything arises, but, you know, there are some risk involved in that because they're intervening into your heart, passing through some valves in some cases. There could be some, you know, potential for damage there, even up to a perforation, they call it, which is where there's a little nick that's placed, a little hole that's placed in the heart or one of the arteries those are risk but they are very very low they're very very minor and when you've got a skilled team like i know you already have with a skilled doctor it's really nothing to worry about now a lot of people complain and say well i don't want to go through this process there are other options such as alimap alishure that you can do that will test for rejection and for them to say that that's right those are much less invasive those are just blood draws that can be done but this is still kind of the the ultimate the top the pinnacle of the real best way to checking for blockages again pressures being high or low and or especially rejection this is just the best way to do it and oftentimes when other methods fail this is the best way i personally i'm a weirdo but I personally prefer this over any other thing they could do, even if it is less invasive, because I know I get results. And being that I've had my aortic valve replaced since transplant, a few other issues have arisen. I just like them going in. I like them getting that firsthand look and that real uh, optimal evidence if you will laying out as to what is going on that's just me most people wouldn't feel that way you probably wouldn't you'd like to go less invasive but over time these become more spread out for example to begin with i was having these biopsies weekly then it went to bi-weekly monthly quarterly semi-annually then annually and then lately again i do have angiograms and stuff done some heart calves done but not the biopsies themselves i'm 10 years post i don't think they've done a biopsy in maybe five years but each transplant center will be 
be different. Each one of them will have a little bit different protocol. But this is kind of the way things go. So if you got any questions or comments, if you can add to the discussion, I encourage you to do that. I would love to, to speak with you about that, to answer some questions or concerns that you have. But for the most part, this is in general a very safe procedure is one that's done thousands of times a day throughout the United States, probably even hundreds of times a week at your own transplant center. It's just a part of life. It is a little bit more difficult than, say, the simple blood draw, depending on who you are. But, hey, again, it's worth it. You get results. You get real life uh, visual uh, test results that can help you to know how you're doing and help you to set those goals even higher in life. Hope this helps you out. But until next time, please Stay stronger, my friend.